call before I ever cry. You answer me from where the thunder hides. I cannot run this heart I'm tethered to. With every step I can lie.
mercy. And God, that you do chase after us no matter what. Lord, help us not refuse you. God, to turn to you. God, to run to you. God, we thank you for that. Thank you for your love and your mercy. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for singing with us. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor this morning. Say hello. So my name is Michael Anderson. I serve in the nursery at Great Oaks. And I think it's 15 or more years now. I've lost, I'm not really sure anymore, but for a number of years, I love it in the nursery. I'm Bentley and I'm five. It's just easy, it's just fun. I like to, I guess I do silly things, balance blocks on my heads and uh, play with the kids and you get to really know them and then after a while you actually miss them when they graduate and move on. I don't know, I just, I don't think I've had a bad day in nursery. It's always fun. It's just a fun, fun day. Can I give you a hint? What else do we do back here? Oh, yeah, we dress up. What do we do with the clothes? What do we do with the clothes? We, we do the story in real life. It's been real life, yeah, we act it out, don't we? So we, I guess we do a short story and a little song usually each week and uh, we have the kids pray together and we, we hand out Bibles, we have a little, kind of have pictures in the Bible for them to find so we, we have a lot of fun each week trying to figure out which picture goes best with the story and then having the kids help find the story and uh, we have not only adults serve but a lot of the adults serve with their children and it's kind of fun to see kind of the kids are in the middle learning to serve and, and joining in. And, I guess I've been in nursery long enough, I've actually seen a couple of people come back and serve in the nursery that I had in the nursery a few years back, many years back, so that's been kind of interesting. Can you think of any stories where he helped people, even if you don't know their the names? Like, what are some ways that Jesus helped people? Ooh, I know one. Saul became Paul. He saved us from our sins. How did he do that? He died on the cross for our sins. That's right. I think with I mean, we serve as a team, so it is it is fun. I've gotten to meet some new people, and sometimes it can be a little, if there's a little bit of a slow time, we get to visit with the other adults, and then we also really serve as a team. And sometimes if we have a challenging child, we kind of pass from one to the other, and just we really just work together. We really become kind of a serving team, so we serve with the same people each each month. Your favorite part of Big Oaks, what is it? Oh, yeah. What is it? Plain. And my favorite part is the Bible stories. Very good. I just think it's a lot of fun, and it's been a great opportunity to meet some of the other adults in the church. And I think you do kind of bond with the kids as they pass through. I don't think there's a downside. I say give it a try and see, see how it works. Good morning. How are we? So we have got an awesome children's ministry here at Great Oaks. So as we continue growing, there's a lot of opportunity for you to get involved and plugged in, so I would encourage you to do that. Uh, you can text in Kids Town to that number that was on the screen. It's in your bulletin as well. You can mark it on a Connect card, uh, but I would encourage you, if you're not serving, not plugged in, 
I would take that step. It is well worth it for you, as you can see from the videos that we've had. So, but Good morning. I'm excited that you're here with us this morning. Um, today, if you didn't know, is National Crown Day, like Crayola crowns. So log that away. It'll be very important later, I'm sure, but probably not. It's worthless information for you, but we're wrapping up spring break. So on that note, where did the crown go for spring break? Color auto. Like that? Let it sink in a second. It's, I got some like head shaking over here. It's better than booze and fresh produce. So thank you. I'll go back, work on something, have something better for you. But no, I'm, I'm excited that you're here with us this morning. We are excited to be a part of what God is doing. Uh, if you're a guest, if it's your first time with us, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we are honored that you're here with us. Whenever you came in, you should have got a, a handout like this. We call it a bulletin. On the side, there's a little card. It's a connect card. If you would just take a couple of moments, put down your information on there. In a moment, we're going to have a time where we're going to worship God with our tithes and offerings, and there's going to be a bucket come by. If you would, just drop that card in that bucket and then pass that right along. That just lets us know that you were here with us, and we have a gift that we would like to get to you this week just as our way of saying thank you for spending the morning with us. We really are honored that you're here. If you're watching online, Facebook or online campus, welcome there. Uh, you can drop a comment. We've got someone in that environment that would love to connect with you this morning, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, like I said, we're going to have a, an opportunity to worship God with our tithes and offerings here in just a moment. Uh, before we do, I want to remind you that we do have three ways that you can give. You can do that in person, you can do that online, or you can text to give, and those instructions you can find on your screen there. Uh, but before we do, I want to highlight this month's stewardship principle to you. And you can find that in your bulletin as well, right there in the middle, or you can follow along on the screen. But this comes from 2 Corinthians verses nine, or chapter 9, verse 7. And here's what God's Word says. It says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And the principle we want to highlight is this, is that motives matter to God, and he loves those who give joyfully with intentionality. So rushers are going to make their way forward, give us an opportunity to worship God in that way. As they do, I want to highlight a couple of quick things to you. Just know there's a lot of great things going on around here at Great Oaks. So make sure to check your bulletin, follow us on Facebook, check online so that you are in the know and not missing out on anything. Um, but a couple of quick things. One, we have Baptism Sunday coming up. So that's going to be April 14th, Sunday, April 14th. If you have said yes to Jesus but you have not taken that next step of baptism to publicly express what God has done inwardly in your heart, I want to encourage you to do that. But it's a command that Jesus has given us, and I believe there's a blessing he gives us whenever we follow his commands. So if you haven't taken that step, you can stop off at Connection Central on your way out and get the info there, or you can do that online. You can go to register.greatoaks.church and get that process started for April 14th. If you have taken that next step of baptism, I want to encourage you to be here as we celebrate, as we celebrate what God has done in the lives of those that are taking that step and professing that outwardly to all of us. So it's going to be a great time. You are not going to want to miss that. Another thing that we have coming up is Easter, all right, April 21st. So Easter, I love Easter. If you are a follower of Jesus, I hope that you love Easter. I mean, we celebrate a risen, resurrected Savior. It is going to be an incredible time, an incredible Sunday for us here. we got some excitement over here. The rest of you, I mean, it's like lunchtime. Wake up already, okay? Right? Easter coming up. All right? Easter's a big deal. A big deal if you're a Jesus follower. All right? But it's also an incredible opportunity that we have to invite other people along. And my heart is that we pack the place out for Easter this year because I want to see heaven packed out. That's the reason why. And I know that we have got a life changing message in the gospel that God has entrusted to us. And we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to share that in a clear way. And all you need to do is invite some people. We are going to share the gospel, the truth of the gospel, like we do week after week 
And we want people here to hear that, to be a part of it. And so what we're doing is we're making that extra easy for you this year, all right? So on your way out this morning, we have got some, some packages for you, some invite bundles, all right? In that, there's an envelope like this with some invite cards, another note card, some candy, some stuff like that. There's 10 of them. So we're asking that you take one bundle and that you use that to invite 10 people to Easter with us to celebrate, all right? So do not, uh, don't overlook the power of the invite, right? I, I started coming to church with my family years ago simply because we were given an invitation. Many of you are here because someone invited you. And if you are a Jesus follower, you're a Jesus follower because God extended an invitation to you through the gospel. There's power in the invitation. Eight out of ten people would come to church if they were just invited. And then it's Easter. Everybody's kind of understood to go to church. All right, they get ready, they get dressed up for that. So we want to utilize that and make good use of it. So pick up that, that packet on your way. out. it's got instructions on how to use those invites, how to be practical with it, some little note cards. So those of you that are like, you hate human interaction, you don't want to talk to another human being, I know who you are, like I, 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 can, I can see you here, all right? It's easy, then you just write that note on there, you can leave it on their door, drop it on their desk at work, you don't even have to see them face to face yet, like you can initiate that invite really easy, really safe, all right? I want to encourage you, grab one of those on your way out, make good use of that invite tool, and let's see what God does. Let's see what God has in store for us as more people are brought in. And Lord willing, more people brought into the kingdom. So if you would, um, let's just prepare our, our hearts and minds. We're going to pray here in just a second. You can go and get your Bible out, get your smartphone out. Uh, if you've got that, you can use a version Bible app. Uh, just click on events, live event there. It'll have all the notes, passages that you'll need. If not, we're going to be in Revelation 3. So you can get your Bible, hold that out. And if you would, just kind of symbolically, just kind of hold your Bible or your phone uh, whatever right in front of you. It's nothing, nothing magical, uh, but we're just going to ask God that he would be gracious in speaking through his word to us this morning. So pray with me. Father in heaven, I, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity that you give us to get together. I thank you, Father, for the reality of heaven and that you want us there. I thank you for the promise you gave us that you're also among us now whenever we get together. So would you help us to make the most of that? I ask that for each of us in here, that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear that your truth would speak to us in a way that changes us, that each one in here would look a little more like Jesus this morning whenever we leave than we were whenever we came in. So God, we love you and we praise you. Amen. <laughs> How are we? Spring All right, spring break. You guys are still in town. You came back in town for church. Extra points for that. If you are um, joining us online and you're on vacation still, but you're watching online, extra Jesus points for that. I said that last week. If you were there, if you're lazy and you just didn't want to leave the house, deducted. All right, deducted just then. I just did it. Revelation chapter 3, if you have your Bible, grab it, head over there. I'm going to perform a public service kind of to start this uh, message today. It may sting a little bit, but in the end, uh, I think uh, we'll be better for it. Sometimes people just need a wake-up call, right? Sometimes you just need a wake-up call. Like you, you people who um, are, are still sporting the mullet. Like, you need a wake-up call. Like, it's gone. It's out. It's out of style. Like, I get it. It's fun. Like, business in the front, party in the back. All right? It's fun. But it's gone. You need, to, you need to wake up. You need to wake up. The mullet is gone. Hey, track suits are out. So if you're wearing track suits, you just need to stop. There's no track suits are gone. Velour suits, soft, comfy. It's like wearing your pajamas outside. They're out. All right? You need to wake up. Don't wear velour suits anymore. Email chains. Don't, don't forward me your junk on email. I don't want it, all right? It's out. Don't do that. You need to wake up. Like, hey, you guys who are taking up two parking spots because you think your car is awesome, stop it, all right? 
Just stop it. You need to wake up. You're not that special. Or maybe you are, but in a different way. So stop doing that. Hey, you, you, need, to, you need to wake up. And in the airport, when you're going to your flight, there are these automated walkways. Just a public service here. There are these automated walkways. That is not a ride at Disney World. Those are to get to your plane or your gate faster, not to be lazy and go on a ride, okay? And so if you're going to be lazy and you're just going to stand there on the automated walkway, you got to stand to the right so that all of us who are trying to make a flight can walk past you on the left. You tracking with me? This is a public service announcement. you got to wake up, all right? Speaking of air travel, they have these awesome things at airports, at gates and other places where you can take your, it's a little station and you can take your carry-on and you can go to it and you can see if your carry-on is the right size. And it's not rocket science. You just put your carry-on into it and if it doesn't fit, it's not it's, it's too big to go on the plane as a carry-on, right? So this is the way it works. So you're like, you're causing a line, you're causing a scene. There's all these people piling up behind you on the plane. We're trying to leave. They're trying to find their seat. And you're trying to fit something the size of a dead yak up in the, carry, up in the overhead bin. Like, no. And the, the, the flight attendants are like trying to be nice, trying to be polite, but they've got it written all over their face. They're like, are you serious right now? Are you, what kind of spatial problems do we have here? You can't fit that in there. This is your wake-up call right now. Okay, you, you people getting into big, long arguments on the Internet or on Facebook, 57 comments back and forth, like you're going to convince somebody of something. You look ridiculous. You look ridiculous. You need to wake up. It's not going to work. You need to put your phone down, put your computer away, stand up, brush the Doritos off your shirt, and walk outside. Like, go outside. Take a walk. Like, talk to somebody about anything. Just talk to somebody in person or use your powers of Facebook for outreach instead of outrage. you got to wake up. Hey, and it's okay, we all, we all need wake-up calls here and there, right? We all need a wake-up call every now and then. Most of my wake-up calls come from one person. If you're a husband, you probably know who I'm talking about. It's my wife. We've been married 15 years, over 15 years of marriage. She has many times delivered a much-needed wake-up call. She's been like, uh-uh, no. That's, no, you need to stop saying that. You need to stop wearing that. You need to stop doing that. Wake up. Right? She's like, that shirt is from high school. You need to throw that out. You need to get that out of the rotation. I saw some wives hitting their husbands on that one like, see, it's not just me. She, sometimes she's like, oh, like, did you, did you, do you not smell that? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, your feet. They smell so, you probably have some kind of medical condition. You need medical intervention. You need, that is not normal. You need, to, you need to wake up. She's like, hey, can you get the clothes, the dirty clothes, all the way into the dirty clothes bin? Like, here's the bin. There's piles of clothes around it. There's no clothes inside of it. Wake up. She's like, hey, you, you've already missed your chance at getting into the NBA. Like, LeBron, you're not going to be LeBron James. Stop trying to toss your clothes from across the room. Like, it ain't gonna, just walk over, drop them in. She's like, this is your wake-up call. You need to wake up, put the clothes in the bin. Maybe it's just my wife that talks to me like that. We all need wake-up calls at times. We're missing it, and we need people to, to come in from the outside of our way of thinking and our bubble and kind of talk to us about some things, point some things out. Like, hey, you're working too much. You need to prioritize your family over your paycheck or getting the new house or getting the better car or whatever. Hey, as a family, you guys are running ragged. You're going everywhere. You guys having a practice or a game or a play or a band recital or whatever every night of every week and every, almost every season because you've got three kids that are involved in something all the time. That's not quality family time. You, you've, got, you've got no time to be engaged with them, no time to model what it is to be a Christ follower, no time to, to really teach them. So you got to wake up. 
Okay, wake up. Hey, hey, we're friends. I love you. But, man, the way you talk to your wife, the way you belittle your husband, it's not good. You need to wake up. That's not, that's not the way you should do that. that. You need to wake up. Hey, this sin, this thing is tearing you apart. You, you got to wake up. This thing is causing you heartache. It's going to tear you apart. You need to wake up. Hey, hey, you are majoring in minors here, man. You are sending emails and you are like, like garnishing support, getting, gathering support and, and you're mad and you're offended and you need to be a big boy or a big girl and just let this thing go. You need, to, you need to wake up. You need to wake up. We all need wake-up calls throughout our lives. And listen, Jesus, over and over again in the scriptures, is happy to deliver those. He is happy to, del- to, to deliver those. Like, when you think of Jesus, what do you think of? You think he's, you know, he's merciful, he's kind, he's understanding, he's patient, right? All those things are true about the Jesus of the Bible. But this is also true. He's direct, he's confrontational, he's in your face at times, he, he's difficult to take. He's constantly, the, the Jesus of the Bible is constantly raising the standard, calling us to more, more holiness, more truth, more mission, more sacrifice. He's constantly calling out sin rebuking, correcting. That's the Jesus of the Bible. Like there's this one point in John chapter 6 where he's talking about how he is the bread of life and there's no other way to eternity with God except through him. And and John 6 says that after he got done with his teaching, a bunch of his disciples just left. They just stopped following him. They just couldn't handle it. They couldn't take the teaching. They couldn't take the wake-up call. I mean, in the, in the Gospels, Jesus is constantly, like, really pretty mean to religious leaders. Like, he calls them names. Like, over and over, he's calling them names. Whitewashed tombs, snakes, fools, hypocrites, vipers, blind guys. I mean, the Jesus of the Bible is not some timid man offering you advice. He, he's not your life coach going, you can do this. You just be the best you. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible isn't a grandparent going, it's okay, here's some candy. That's not, that's not what the, that's all that grandparenting is, in case you were wondering. That, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. He is the master of the wake-up call. And so that same Jesus, the master of the wake-up call, was executed on a Roman cross. He died, and then three days later, he defeated death and rose again. The tomb was empty. Isn't that good news? We celebrate that every year on a holiday we call Easter, which is only a few weeks away. Then about 40 years after he rose from the, 40 days after he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and he sits at, the Bible says he sits at the right hand of the Father to this day. But right after he ascended, the book of Acts tells us that he sent us his Holy Spirit to dwell inside of us and to give us power and to, to testify to the truth, and then also to start the church, to, to start the church of Jesus Christ. And, and so the church began, and there was this fire of a church just just spreading and spreading and spreading and going from town to town to town, city to city to city. These churches were planted in all of these places. And then about 60 years after uh, the Holy Spirit was sent, around 95 AD, Jesus visited the apostle John in a vision. John had been exiled to prison on an island called Patmos, and he was most likely the last surviving apostle. Every other apostle had been murdered for their faith and love of Jesus Christ. And, and he told John to write this vision down, and that vision we call it the book of Revelation. And in the first couple chapters, actually, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, there are these letters that Jesus dictated to the Apostle John and told him to pass off to seven different churches um, that were in the area, real churches, some of the first churches to ever exist. And proving that he, Jesus, even after he rose from the dead, is still the master of the wake-up call, most of these seven letters in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are just that. They're a wake-up call to the church that they're addressed to. 
And so we've studied the first four in this series that we're calling Dear Church. Today is number five. We've studied the, the letters to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and last week, Thyatira. So if you missed those, to get the context of all this, make sure you listen online. Um, get those online or on iTunes or whatever. Today we're going to study the letter to the church in a city called Sardis. And it is definitely a wake-up call. Like in most of these letters, Jesus has some criticism, but he also has some encouragement. In this letter, there's really no encouragement to the church at Sardis. This is a wake-up call for, for this church and it's not just a wake-up call for Sardis. God preserved this letter for us. It's to the church at Sardis, but it's also to the church at Great Oaks because he said over and over and over in all seven of these letters, at the end of each letter, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So if you'll have an ear to hear, if you'll be humble enough to listen to what Jesus says, to take his rebuke and his correction, wise enough to heed his warning then this letter is not just to the ancient church at Sardis, but it's to you as well. And you, like them, have a chance to be awoken. But before we read it, let me just tell you a little bit about Sardis. It was this very wealthy city. Um, the people there were safe and secure. Um, they were happy. Um, it was kind of an easy city to le live in. They had all that they needed. There was a sense of security and safety because the city itself was set uh, on the top of a very steep hill, uh, literally. And so the, the people of Sardis uh, often thought of themselves as a city that, that, that is impervious to attack and ransacking. And so they thought that they were really safe, even though uh, it had happened two times before this letter was written in Revelation chapter 3 that invading armies had actually overtaken the city. Both of those times, those armies reported later that all they really had to do was get up the hill. If they just made it up the steep hill, they found the city unguarded. They found people asleep. They found people not ready for battle. For the church, there, there was really no persecution to speak of in Sardis. Many of the other churches in these seven Letters in Revelation 2 and 3, they're facing heavy persecution, like being beaten, thrown in prison, killed uh, for their faith. Not so in Sardis. They were safe, comfortable, maybe asleep, or, or even worse than that. Let's read it. Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Each of these seven letters starts out with a description of the risen Christ that ties back to Revelation chapter 1. So you can look at that longer description another time. This time, he's described as having the seven stars in his hand and the seven spirits of God. The stars are the leaders of the, each of the churches, the seven churches. We've talked about that over the last few weeks. The, the seven spirits of God, this is talking about the Holy Spirit. Seven is just a symbolic number uh, that means perfection or completion. And so this is the Holy Spirit. And, and it says this, let's read the rest of that verse. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Okay, so imagine you're a part of the church at Sardis. Things are good. Things are safe. You would even say that your church is blessed, favored of the Lord. And so your, sin, your, your leaders send out word to the group saying, hey, we've got an important kind of announcement thing we need to talk to you about. Something important has happened. So, hey, if you can make it. I know you've got a lot going on. I know that maybe you've got some properties to manage and your social life is kind of full. I know you have the luxury of going to the park, but they go, hey, we know, we know all that, but if you could just try to make it this Sunday, that would be great. We've got something important to share with you. So they send out word. And so you show up. I mean, you're going to do something else. Mow the lawn, clean the house, refinish that table you've been wanting to refinish, wash the chariot. You know, take care of the stuff that you have. Or maybe go to the lake, play baseball, watch online. But since they sent this word out that there's something important, you, you go ahead and you show up. And once everyone's in the room, they say, hey, we got a letter from Jesus. And you think, great, 
this is awesome. Like, we are so favored, so blessed. This is great. We got a letter from Jesus. This is going to be great. You're not sure why your leaders are so somber. But you know that you're a mature, life-giving Christian. And your church is the same. And so you're not really worried about it. And they read the letter. And Jesus says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're actually dead. And make no mistake, Sardis, the church at Sardis, they thought they were doing great. They thought they were, they were doing great. They thought they were blessed. They thought they had a, a, a faith that was alive. Not only that, but other churches thought the church at Sardis was doing great. They envied them. They looked at them and said, man, we, I wish we were like the church at Sardis. So this is tough for them to hear. What? Dead? What is Jesus talking about? We have a great church. We do so many cool things. We're so favored. Look at all these people. It's a great church. We're so mature, so safe. Jesus goes, you're dead. You're dead. You think you're alive. Others think you're alive, but you're actually dead. You can dress up a dead thing. You can put clothes on a corpse, even a dead branch separated from the trunk may have some leaves on it, may even bear an apple or two, but it's still dead. Now look at the next verse. Here's the wake-up call if that wasn't one already. Verse 2. He says, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember them what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. So Jesus goes, you're dead. You think you're alive, but you're actually dead. Wake up. Others think you're alive, but God doesn't. And God's opinion is what matters here. Your works are not complete. You, you think your, your fruit is not what you think it is. It's, it's rotten. But Jesus says there's still some hope. It's just small. There's a few who, who maybe haven't died yet. They're not living. They're not thriving. They're dying. They're about to die. But he says they may be able to be saved. Jesus says if you want that part of the church to live, they need to remember. Remember what they received. In other words, remember the truth of the gospel. Remember God's word. And then don't just know it, don't just remember it, but keep it, Jesus says. Add action to it, remember it, but also keep the word, follow it, take action. And then he says, repent. And Jesus' instruction to every church that has an issue in these seven letters is the same. Repent, turn, change, repent. Then Jesus, he issues, issues a warning. Look at the rest of verse 3, wake up calls. They have some teeth to them, especially if they're from Jesus. He says, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. It's going to happen quick, and just like always, you're going to be asleep because you think you're safe, and you think you're alive, and you think things are fine, but you're going to be asleep, and I'm going to come against you, and you're not even going to notice it. I'm going to come like a thief in the night. If you don't wake up, if you don't repent. But then Jesus gives us a little bit of hope. Some, something different might happen if we do wake up. It starts in verse 4. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So with the other churches in these seven letters that Jesus rebuked, uh, it seemed like the ones with the problems were actually kind of the minority of the church, that the church itself was okay, but it had this faction within it that was stuck on some kind of theological problem or they were accepting false teaching or involved in sinful behavior. But, but most of the church was okay. And Jesus was writing this letter going, hey, you got to take care of that, that part of the church that's got a problem. But Sardis is different. It's, it's the opposite. The majority of the church s seems to have a faith that is dead. And it's the minority that has yet 
to have this problem. It's a minority, only some of them that haven't soiled their garments, Jesus says. And for that group and for the, those who would repent, those who, who are real followers of Jesus, there, there's great news here. They're going to be dressed in white. Their names will be written in the book of life and never erased from it, meaning that they'll have eternity with Jesus. Christ will confess their names before his Father and the angels in heaven. In other words, he's going to vouch for them. He's going to vouch for them. All of this is talking about their, their heavenly standing. And the heavenly standing of anybody who would give their lives over completely to God, who would repent and follow Jesus. He says, in heaven, before God and his angels, in the presence of the risen Christ, remember, fire in his eyes, sword, double-edged sword, he's holding stars in his hand, I mean, this fierce image of the risen Christ. In the presence of the risen Christ, these will have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear at all. So, so hear this final word of encouragement in this letter. He's, he's the master of the wake-up call, Jesus is. But he's not just calling these things out for fun. I mean, he, he doesn't get some kind of sadistic pleasure in watching you squirm under the heat of his rebuke. He's not a dictator just wanting to control you all the time. This is for your good. You may have a faith that is dead, but that's not Jesus' desire. He wants you to have a faith that is alive. I mean, he wants, he wants you to be clothed in white. He wants you to, your name to be written in the book of life. He wants to vouch for you before his father. He wants life for you, but he's not going to make anything up. If you don't repent, if you don't wake up, if your works, like he said, are not complete before God, then it's not going to go well for you. It's not going to go well for you. Okay, so that's the letter to Sardis, letter five of seven. Now, let me say this. I think out of all of these seven letters written to these seven churches, the church that is most like the American church, the church that you and I find ourselves a part of today, I think is the church in Sardis. Now, the seventh letter to Laodicea is a close second, all right? Uh, but I would, I would put my vote in for Sardis, being most like the American church of today. We live in a very safe, secure little world, steady, sheltered. I mean, the things we complain about are things that most of the world has never experienced. The things that stress us out are, are luxuries that most of the world has never experienced. The things we worry about are are trivial at times. If persecution is what the other churches are going through in these seven letters, being beaten, thrown in prison, killed for your faith, if that's what persecution is, then we know nothing of it. We have no experience with it. We are in many ways sheltered from the cost of following Christ. We're sheltered from the cost of following Christ, and that is, that's a problem because when there is no cost to following Jesus, it's, it's just too easy to take it easy. The temptation for the sheltered is always to take it easy, like we're safe, we're good, we're favored, we're blessed. Don't worry, it's fine. No urgency, we sleep while the world burns. Why? Because our faith is not worth much because it didn't cost us anything. When your faith costs you something, then you value it. It's precious. It's primary. It's priority above all those other things, above activities and money and laying around at the house and saying yes to everything your kid wants to do and, and, and shining your trinkets. And listen, when your faith is central because you value it because it costs you something, when your faith is central and then you see someone who doesn't have that faith, who doesn't have the hope in Jesus that you have, who doesn't have the strength of the Holy Spirit that you have, if your faith is central and you value it, then you go talk to them about it. 
You tell them about your faith. You model it. You talk to them about the truth of the gospel. Of course you do. The last thing you would do in that situation if your faith was primary and central and valuable, the last thing you would do is take it easy. We are in many ways sheltered from the cost of following Christ. And that's a problem. Because when there is no cost to following Jesus, it's just too easy to take it easy. Something else happens when there is no cost to following Jesus. We can know the word without keeping it. There's this temptation to know the word without keeping it, to hear it without doing it. That's what it means to have a faith that is dead, to be a hearer of it but not a doer of it. Because James chapter 2 said, faith without works is dead. And James chapter 1 says that you shouldn't be hearers of the word only and so deceive yourselves. The church at Sardis was deceived. Many in the church of America are deceived. Deceived into thinking that we can be hearers of the word only and call that faith. Deceived into thinking that a faith that is alive can be apart from action. It cannot. A faith can't be alive apart from action. That kind of faith is dead. I think there are church buildings across our country filled with corpses. People claiming a living faith because they show up to a building called a church two or three times a month. That would have been actually 20 years ago. Now it's more like one or two times every one or two months. People claiming a, a, a living faith because they wear the Christian t-shirt and profess Christianity as a religion. The people claiming a Christian or a living faith because they know the Bible, even though they don't actually do what it says. I think there are churches all over who, that are filled with, with corpses. And they point to their reputation like, like I, I'm a solid Christian. I've been in church for this church for 25 years. I'm respected. Everybody says I'm a great Christian. They tell me that all the time. They point to their reputation. Hey, I know the word of God. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I, I know the Bible. Corpses who think they're alive. Zombies of the modern Christian faith movement, so to speak. We quote scripture, but we don't do it. We hear it on Sundays, but that is the end. We are comfortable in our castles set atop a hill, just like the city of Sardis was. Comfortable staying inside, keeping our faith inside. I mean, sure, sometimes we'll read the Bible and we'll get excited and we'll post something on Facebook or we'll, we'll share something on social media, but that's really the extent of it. And some of you are scared to even do that, to live your faith out loud on the internet. We hear something convicting like hell is a real place of eternal torment apart from God and how Jesus is the only hope uh, for someone to, to get past that and, and to have eternity with him and how we, we pass by just hundreds of people every day who are in darkness headed towards that eternal torment apart from God. We hear that and we may even be emotionally moved by it. We may shed a tear. We may be able to talk passionately with other churchgoers like this is important. We may be able to talk at length about how we should go about fulfilling the command of God to be a light in a dark place and to chase after lost people with the truth of the gospel. We may have methods and opinions like this is how we should do it. Not that over there. This is how we should do it. But the extent to which we are actually involved in doing something about it is that we show up next week at that building called a church. If we don't have something more important going on, 
and we maybe give some money to the church so that they can do it. We're a lot, I think we're a lot like Sardis. I think if Jesus was going to write us a letter, it would begin in the same way. I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Your works are not complete before God. So where do we go from here? What can we do? And Jesus didn't leave us hanging. He didn't leave the seven churches that, that in Revelation 2 and 3 hanging. He doesn't leave us hanging. He actually, in this letter, says three things that we should do if we find ourselves in a situation where our faith is dead or parts of our faith is dead or our faith is dying. He gives us three things to do. I mentioned them earlier. Number one, remember the word. Go back to it. Tether your life there. Go back Back to it often. Read it by yourself. Read it with your spouse. Read it with your kids. Go back to it all the time. Remember the truth. When you make a decision or you have a question, go to the word of God. Remember the word. And then number two, keep the word. That means you do it. There's action. This is where your faith changes from theory to being real. Where your faith changes from being dead to being alive. But here's the thing. You can't keep the word of God by just reading it in your armchair at your house in your living room. That's not how you keep the word of God. You can't keep the word of God by yourself or by sitting in a chair like this on a Sunday morning every week or once a month or once every two months or, or whatever. You can't just study the word. You have to actually do it. And that happens around other people. You have to get around other people whose faith is alive, or at least people who want to have a faith that is alive. You got to get around those people and say, I, I want to have a faith that is alive too. And not just, like I said, study the word, but actually do it together. At Great Oaks, at Great Oaks, that's, that's why we talk about life groups so much. They are our goal for every single soul that walks through the door because this, what we're doing here in these three services on a Sunday morning, this is not the extent of church. It's just the tiny beginning of what it means to be the church. Church happens outside of these walls. Church happens when you gather around other believers and you encourage one another and you keep each other accountable and you move out from there to shine the light in a dark world. And so life groups are where you go at Great Oaks, where you go from hearing to doing, where you go from dead faith to a faith that's alive. So remember the word. Keep the word. Then number three, Jesus said, repent. Just confess and change direction. Ask God for forgiveness for having a faith that is dead. Ask him to revive it. Confess that you've, been, you've become accustomed to your safety, your security, your abundance. Confess that you have this faith that is dead, that in many ways you are a hearer of God's word only. And then move from that confession to actually doing something, moving forward in some, going in a different direction. And I think that happens best by more confession. So I think you confess to God that you've got a problem, that your faith is dead. And then in repentance, when you turn to act, when you go in a different direction, that, that next step, that's confession too. It's just this time it's confession to other Christ followers, not to God only. So now it goes from something between me and God to something between me and some Jesus followers. And I go, man, I don't want to have a faith that's dead. Did you, did you hear what Pastor Jake said on Sunday? Did you read what Jesus wrote to, to the church at Sardis? Like, I do not want Jesus to write me that letter and say that my faith is actually dead even though I have a reputation of it being alive. I don't want that. Hey, can you, I've confessed it to God, but now I'm confessing it to you. Can you help me? Can we go together in this? Can we become Christ followers who have a faith that is living? So repentance it includes this confession to God, but a lot of times we stop there. That's not repentance. That's just confession. 
Repentance is confession to God, and then we turn, change direction with the help of other Jesus followers. So remember the word, keep the word, and Jesus says repent. A wake-up call, a wake-up call can be hard to hear, right? It can sting. It's worth it, but it can sting. And maybe this morning, Jesus, the master of the wake-up call, is is delivering a wake-up call to you. It may sting, but it's by his grace and his mercy that you are receiving it. He's giving you this wake-up call because he loves you, because he wants good for you, because he wants you to have a faith that is alive, because he wants you to wear white garments, because he wants you to, to have your name written in the book of life, because he wants to vouch for you before his Father in heaven. And so if you'd be honest enough to say that you have a faith that is dead, If this morning you would be honest enough to say that you have a faith that is dying or that there are parts of your faith that are dead, that there's no action involved there, that you're just a hearer of the word in this area only, not, not a doer of the word. If you would be honest enough to admit that you have a faith that is dead or at least parts of your faith are dead or dying. You want to hear some good news? Jesus... Jesus is not just the master of the wake-up call. He's the master of the comeback, too. I mean, he is the master. He is the expert at raising back to life that which was formerly dead, isn't he? I mean, he is all the, He knows a lot about resurrecting dead bodies. And he is not... The corpses don't scare Jesus. He was one. So hear what I'm saying. Take hope in this and, and reach in and, and, and grab what the, the Bible says you have access to, which is the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. To raise back to life what is dead inside of you. Beloved, hear what I'm saying to you this morning. Wake up. You've got to wake up. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your goodness and your mercy, your word that is true, that is timely and timeless. God, I pray that this wake-up call to the church at Sardis would be a wake-up call to the church at Great Oaks, that individual believers in the church at Sardis that accepted it would be like individual believers here at Great Oaks who would also accept this wake-up call. I pray, God, for those who have dead and dying pieces of their faith, that they would be honest today. And Holy Spirit, that you would revive their faith, revive our faith. May we be known as a people of living faith, faith that ends in action, not just hearers of your word, but doers of it also. As we continue in an attitude of prayer with everybody's eyes closed and heads bowed, here's what I want to do. If you're in here and you'd be honest enough to say, you know what, my faith is totally dead. I just walked in. Somebody invited me. I used to have faith. I don't have it anymore. Or you'd say, man, lately my faith has been, I felt it's been dying. Or maybe you'd say there's some part of your faith that is dead or dying. If you'd be honest enough to to say that today. I want to say a prayer over you. And so here's what I'd love for you to do. I'd love for you to just kind of put your hands out in front of you with the the palms up, just like you're receiving. So if you'd say there's any dead or dying part of my faith that I want Jesus to revive, I want the resurrection power of Christ to bring this back to life. If that's you, this has a very small step of obedience and faith. Nobody's looking around, so it's not even that hard of a step of obedience and faith. But put your hands out with your palms up, ready to receive, and I want to pray over you. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, I ask that through the resurrection power of Christ, that you would raise back to life that which is dead in our faith, in our hearts. God, those who are 
honest enough to put their hands out and go, God, I want a living faith. I want a faith that is alive. I don't want a dead faith. I don't want the letter from Jesus that says I have a reputation of being alive, but I'm actually dead. Those that would, that would say, God, I want a living faith. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would resurrect their faith right now, that you would revive it, that from this day forward, God, supernaturally, they would go out from this building and live their faith out loud in every way that you've called them to do. Whatever piece of their faith that needs reviving, or if there's someone in this room who, who used to know Christ, who used to have faith, who used to used to walk with Jesus, but that faith is long dead, I pray in Jesus' name that you would revive it and resurrect it, and that it would live for eternity, God. I pray, God, that we would be found faithful that we would be those you said in Revelation 3, God, that would wear white garments, that our names would be written in the book of life, and that you would confess our names before the Father and the angels in heaven. Revive our faith, Jesus. Let us be known as a church of living faith. It's in your holy and precious name that we pray this prayer. And everybody said, amen. Why don't you stand with me? Here's my prayer for you today. May the Holy Spirit reveal to you, no matter how much it stings, where your faith is dead. May the resurrection power of Christ bring back to life those dead parts of your faith. And may you hear the wake-up call from Jesus this morning. May you not respond with offense or anger, but may you respond by remembering the word, keeping the word. And most importantly, repenting. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming today. We'll have prayer workers on the side that would love to pray for you. As always, my encouragement to you is that you would talk this over with a life group this week. If you're not in a life group, stop at Connection Central. We'll get you plugged in. We're talking about living your faith out loud, having a faith that is alive and not dead. And so my challenge every week to you is that if you were helped to take your next step towards God today, don't let it stop here. Let's not make Sunday mornings the end of our faith. Let's let Sunday mornings be the beginning of how we live out our faith. So go out today and be a Jesus follower who makes and disciples other Jesus followers. We'll see you next week for letter number six. God bless. To God of creation there at the start before the beginning of time there's no point of reference he spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life and as you speak
chase down my heart through all of my failure and pride. to find our place in you, to follow after you with everything that we've got, Lord. Give you praise for that. Amen. Amen. See you guys next week. Take care. We'll see you then. Have a great day.